Hi, and uh, thank you for, for joining us for this, this webinar. I'm the, the product manager at uh, Horizon Discovery for the Diagnostics Division. What I'm going to do, what I'm going to do is you know, give you a, a little bit of a flavor of what we do at Horizon Discovery, and then walk through uh, and talk about the FISH and IHC standards. So Horizon Discovery is a genomic translational company, and we, we have business units that cover gene editing, discovery services, target uh, ident identification and validation, as well as, and, and this is the, the unit that I'm responsible for, the, the diagnostic reagents. Now, one question that we always ask ourselves and ask, um, ask other people in our, in our labs and have started to really push and ask pathology labs, whether it be molecular pathologists or histopathologists or cytogeneticists, is how do you know that your assay is working today? Now, the most common results that we get from, from that, that question is, um, well, the positive control that you're using in the kits gives you the expected result. Or, you know, the negative result, the negative control that you're, you're using gives you the, the uh, expected result. And, you know, that's, 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 all, that's all good. Uh, the next questions we, we ask ourselves and, you know, we, we start to, to ask um, you guys is, well, what, what are the controls that you're using? Where are they from? And what's their suitability and how are they validated? One of the most worrying things for me uh, when I've asked these questions is that often the negative result, certainly in molecular diagnostic assays, can be just water. And so completely non-representative of, of a patient sample. And likewise, uh, with, positive, with positive control for molecular assay, it's often a, a short primer that will be, you know, is always easy to amplify. For fish or IHC, it's occasionally the positive control can be so overexpressed or, you know, such high copy number that any probe will work for it and, again, isn't patient relevant or patient suitable. Now, when you go through your, your you know, the, the workflow, I've got a very simple schematic here where you have the tumor sample. It may go off to uh, histology. It may go off to cytogenetics analysis. It may go down to, to genotyping, and then you have diag diagnosis. So every single of these, every, each of these steps, there's the opportunity of variability to creep in. You've got sample quality, sample heterogeneity. When you've got the tumor, is the, are the boundary of the tumor, does that show uh, the same characteristics as, say, the center of the tumor? Does it vary throughout the tumor when you're, you're looking at IHC slides or, or FISH slides? The, the antibody that you're using for IHC will make a big, big impact on, on how sensitive your, your assay is and how you score. You then got for for cytogenetics and, and running fish the, the probe choice. Which supplier do you use for for your probe? Which probe do you use from a supplier? Because some suppliers will have maybe three or four different uh, options. And then the, the the final, which is sometimes forgotten, is the the characteristics of the mutation that you're looking at. So a good example is the EMR four ALK translocation, which is a relatively uh, new diagnostic test. If you're looking at fish are the probes that you're using covering all of the variants that um, have currently been identified? And if they are covering all the variants, which ones are you able to then distinguish which ones are clinically relevant if, um, if they are all clinically relevant? Now, this is a, another, you know, uh, a nice slide to summarize very much how, how you pick which, which tests you may, you, may, uh, you may choose to do depending on the mutations you're looking for. Typically, Rare mutations of SNPs or small deletions would be genotyped in the molecular diagnostic laboratory. For much larger chromosomal abnormalities, so say gene copy number variation or large deletions or translocations, would then either be tested using cytogenetics or histology. Now, as I'm going to be talking uh, a lot about IHC and FISH, I thought it would be good at the start just to, to highlight you know, the differences between the assays and maybe some of the challenges that you face either running IHC or, or running FISH. Now from this table, it's, it's, uh, it's easy to see. So with FISH, as you know, it's, you're looking at the genetic abnormality. IHC, you're looking at the, the protein expression. 
and there's argument that you know protein expression is a much more attractive uh, attractive property to be looking at than say the the genetic abnormality. In terms of choosing a probe or an antibody for testing, I'd say for for both IHC or fish, it's, it can be difficult, even for the very well established assays. So for HER2 testing, you've already got three or four suppliers that have HER2 as an IHC test or as a fish test. So how do you choose that, and how do you know it's that assay is working in your hands and it's the best one for you to be using? IHC, I'd say, is is easier and, and simpler to set up, but then the objective, then the scoring is much more difficult. So you, you do need a much keener eye and a much more experienced eye to actually subjectively score what you're looking at. And fish is the other way around, where I'd, it's, it's much more difficult to set up initially, but once it's set up, the the scoring is much more binary. You can see, you know, it's, it's much more yes or no. Now, IHC has then has the benefit that it is it's um, more cost efficient and will give you a faster result. Now, different labs, you know choose IHC or FISH, or they, you do a screening with IHC followed by FISH. For us, it's not so much how you, apply, how you apply, it's more how do you know that if you are using IHC, it's working today, or if you are using FISH, the assay is working for you. Now, as, we, as, as you all know, tumor samples show a high degree of heterogeneity, and so depending on which section you get from a tumor would may actually govern how efficient your test is due to morphological or you know epigenetic changes, and different uh, different tumor cell clones will will diverge as as the tumor grow as the tumor grows and develops. And depending on the method you're using, you'll be able to you may be able to have a limit detection down to 10 percent or 50 percent or 100 percent with with fish or IHC. The, the the nice thing is that you actually get to you can see the see the slides, you can see the stain, you can see, you can normally see how, how well your method has worked. For molecular diagnostics, which we're not really going to touch on today, it's much more difficult to know how, it's difficult to know and understand the limit of detection. So if you consider the, the variability that can sneak in during the process, and this is very much, you know, it, it can sometimes be out of your control as well. So, for example, your, the sample quality is, is key to to either fish or IHC. The sample, some of you may not may or may not know whether your, whether your sample has been treated in formalin for one hour or four hours or, or 24 hours. You don't know once it's been treated, has it been, you know, has it then been sat on the side or has it been vacuum packed? Uh, has it been stored at room temperature? Has it been stored at, at four degrees? All of these variables will, will come together to, to impact on the quality of your sample. And certainly for for IHC, that would that would then impact on whether or not you can you, know, you get efficient antigen ret retrieval and then get a good stain using your antibody. Likewise for fish, this may impact on uh, background or non-specific staining. And if you've got if um, if you're setting up a new assay where you you're not actually sure you've got a positive result. Non-specific staining for either IHC or FISH can be a real problem because when do you know when a, a false positive isn't actually a real positive? And without reference slides to, it, to help you along the way, you could be using a lot of your precious patient samples trying to understand and, and get an assay up and running and optimized. I thought it would be good to, to take HER2 as an example because it's a very well-established test. It uses both IHC and um, FISH, and the, the the accepted guidelines are that you would you'd take the tumor sample that was um, from breast tissue, you'd then test it using IHC, you'd score it from zero to to three plus. Anything that's zero or or one plus would then be considered negative. If it's a two plus, it would be equivocal, and so it would then go through down to her two. Um, fish testing. If that was then, if the fish test gave it came out as a positive result, you'd, it would then be recommended for, or, for, or consideration for Herceptin treatment. If it, if the IHC is strikingly positive, so three plus, it would also be considered for Herceptin straight away. Now, 
what I've got on the next two slides is the challenges that I see for either IHC or, or FISH. IHC, as I mentioned briefly, is, is very subjective, particularly for the around the boundaries. So how you the difference between it's not easy to see on this on this slide, but the difference between a one plus score and a two two plus score. This would go this would be a negative. This would then be considered for, for fish testing. Without an experienced eye or experienced lab, the, these decisions can be very difficult to make and could actually be this is where you know error could error could could sneak in. With the with the uh, availability of reference slides, this, these types of these types of uh, decisions can become much more uh, obvious and much clearer to, to make. If you do want to see these slides in more more detail, this is this has come straight from the the DACO uh, manual, so you can actually you know you can see much higher resolution for your for your um, for your use. And then for, for for fish, like I said before, I think with fish it's, it's more difficult to get fish set up initially. But once it's set up, the scoring is, is much simpler because it's it's in my eyes it's, it's more binary. Um, the only time when scoring can start to become difficult is when you have uh, either nuclei that are overlapping, like here, or you have you know the nuclei isn't fully visible, and then you have to start not counting those. Those cells, but in both, I mean, I didn't mention the last slide, but in both fish and IHD, the sample quality can really make an impact on on how easy it is to to actually look at look at these um, look at these particular mutations. And the, what they thought we, I mean, what's been um, achieved in what's been applied and uh, achieved in some way to standardise HER2 testing is bringing in the control slides. And so for, if you're running an IHC test, the control slides have to be included in every run. And the actual result has to match the prediction result. So if you're, if you're looking at the 1 plus control cell line and you get a 1 plus, that run is acceptable. If, this, if the 1 plus doesn't come out as 1 plus, then you need to throw away the, all of the data from, those, from that run and, and run it again, maybe getting in a new kit or a new antibody. And the results require both portion and intensity measurements. And what I would, you know, what I'd like to say, and you know, it's my, it's my real feeling is that by bringing in the, the reference slides, we've been able to standardise how HER2 testing is being applied. And that's a very good time to for us to really, for me to introduce what we believe is a reference standard. So for us, it's an independent, externally validated reference material. It, it will allow you to understand the sensitivity and limit detection of your assay. It allows you to monitor the reproducibility of your molecular assay. And they are absolutely critical for the development and quality control of your assays. And this is because it, they enable you to start testing um, new assays, or if you're, if you're switching from, say, one probe to a different probe, you can test using the reference reference standards before having to then test using clinical samples, and this is this is a very useful tool for when you've got rare mutations. EML for ALK, you know, some labs may only see five to ten positive results in a given year, and so to, to have to wait or to have to use those samples to to then set up the assay. Is a, very, is a big challenge. So if you can set up the assay and get the assay uh, close to fully optimized and fully validated with, a, with reference material, it then allows you that when you, you can get your hands on positive material, you can do the final validation with that positive material. And I think it's what we, you know, what the question I had at, at the very start is how do you know that your, your assay is working today? Reference standards will tell you if they're run every single batch. The next part of the talk, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the technology we have at Horizon, and then try and, I guess, in some ways stimulate uh, thoughts at your end of, of how we can apply the, the technology to develop um, further fish slides or, or IHC reference slides. We've, 
we've, we've, we've made a big progress and developed a lot of reference standards, and I'm going to show you the next couple of slides for molecular assays. And over the last nine to 12 months, we've, re we've started to move more into the IHC and, and, the, and the fish um, world, as it were. And we have some good ideas. We've had some successes. But I think it's, for us, it's critical that we get feedback from, from, from you guys and also you know, develop partnerships and collaborations so that we know where to go, especially for a lot of these new translocations that are coming out. We are essentially going to be together setting the scene of how these, are, how these should be tested um, moving forward and almost setting guidelines for you know, the best way of testing these testing for these mutations. So coming back to, to this slide, what we have at Horizon is we have the gene editing platform Genesis. So what we do is we take a wild, a, what, you know, what would be considered a wild type cell line, you know, from tra traditional sources like ATCC or, or whatever. We take that and then do a single cell dilution simply because, you know, every single cell line that we get from external sources is uh, heterogeneous. And so by single cell dilution, diluting, we then create a clonal wild type cell line where we know that every single cell within that, within that uh, clonal population is, is close to identical. We then take that and uh, run to, uh, use our genesis gene editing technology to then generate our clonal mutant cell line. This again, once we've generated this, you would go to a single cell dilution step as well to ensure that the mutant cell line is and at both these steps, these cell lines go through full cell line validation. Now, the validation we do is you know, um, very intensive, so we, we do STR profiling and SNP6 to ensure the cell line we have is, is what it should be. We then confirm the integration at the endogenous loci of the mutation um, using uh, DNA and uh, uh, DNA locus specific PCR. We used uh, digital PCR to, or um, traditional uh, CDNA PCR to look at the expression of the allele. And also we can use our digital PCR platform to confirm the clonality as well as the, the gene copy number. And I think the most important, important, the most important part or the most important bit of information on this slide is that at the, the end point of our engineering is that we have a clonal mutant cell line and a clonal wild type cell line that are essentially identical except for that one mutation that has been incorporated. And that is as close to patient genetics as, as you can get as a, as a model system. Now, you know, some of the other half of our, our company uses this for, for functional analysis. What, we'd, what we've done is taken uh, the mutant and the wild type cell lines to, to develop reference standards. And we've done this in, in different flavors. So we have uh, the genomic DNA, either wild type or mutant uh, on their own, or wild type and mutant mixed together, either as singleplex or multiplex. Uh, we've generated FFP blocks using the cell lines. We've, ge we've generated FFP xenograft blocks, so we've taken cell line, injected them into the mouth, and, and, and uh, grown a xenograft from there. And um, we've then taken FFP sections either from the xenograft blocks or the uh, cell line blocks. Um, and likewise, we've, we've generated, we've now started to sort of move really into this area where we generate cell slides either in the FFP format or cell format or, or metaphase on, on request. And depending on the, the reference standard that we, we generate, we'll, very, we'll then govern which type of validation we go to, whether it's Sanger sequencing, digital PCR, RT-PCR, FISH, or IHC. And for the molecular off offering that we have, We've got a very, you know, we've got a very extensive catalogue now where we're covering a lot of the main targets like uh, BRAF, AKT1, the KRAS, EGFR, NRAS, and we're now we're now starting to move into the into the fish and IHC and looking to expand a, cat a similar size catalogue for, for that. Now, what we what we believe and uh, what I'm going to show in the next few slides is that. With all the technology we have and the experience we have in generating the, the FFP blocks and FFP xenographs, we can very easily, and actually we've got some sort of internal data uh, supporting this, very easily generate a IHC slide which will have a, you know, have a, a varying proportional score. I think that's relatively simple. 
with IHC, there's obviously lots of different scores and paradigms, and one of them is an intensity score, where you, have, you know, this is seen for the, we've seen for, for her too as well. And this is, the intensity score is much more difficult to replicate, because it, the, the biology behind it, we need to, it's not just, it's not just editing at the, the gene level, it's somehow editing or controlling at the RNA, um, RNA expression or even the, the protein expression level. So for the proportional score, like I said, it's relatively simple. We take a mutant that we've, we've generated, so like an ENL4 out translocation mutant. We can then uh, mix that with, a, with the wild type that was used to generate mutant and then create a reference slide from that um, using our FFP processing technology that we have. What's really nice with our, with our FFP technology is its consistency. So here we have eight different FFP blocks where we've taken sections, random sections from, from the blocks and we, we're able to control the exact number of cells per block which is very important for moving into, into IHC and fish where we want to ensure that if, you, if you're doing, a, if you doing a counting then, it, then your, your field of view will always be similar. So if you always want to look at hundreds, if you want to uh, say look at look for 50 positives within 100 or you're looking at 20 positives within 100, the consistency and the homogeneity of our blocks and sections will always remain the same. We go one step further as well um, because obviously H&E is always uh, subjective to the eye so we try and make it um, objective so what we do is extract the DNA and check that the DNA um, lies between the, the boundaries of um, 550 and and 750 nanograms to ensure that the sections consistently have the same DNA content and you know then we uh, apply that to cell content. We also, and this is probably one of the night one of the neatest bits of kit that we ever we ever brought into the, the lab, um, is the digital PCR uh, equipment. And what digital PCR allows you to do is count uh, count uh, the allele burden of any given uh, sample down to an accuracy of, I mean, we're down to about 0.1% accuracy. And so what we've been able to do is, is take the mutant cell lines and the wild type cell lines, mix them to a defined allelic frequency, so say 25%. Uh, we then, once we've mixed them, we then fix them in a, uh, generate a uh, fix them in formalin, put them into a uh, FFP block with paraffin embedding, and then we've taken here, we've taken uh, sections from throughout the block, so it's start, middle, and end. And as you can see, the block shows 25% mutation all the way through the block. Likewise, we've generated a 5% mutation block. Again, that comes out uh, slightly higher than five, but it's within the uh, expected uh, expected range. And then you've, you've also got, you know, as low as a 1% mutation. We can also, with the, the digital PCR, and it's always tricky when I start writing talks not to start um, just selling the digital PCR uh, machine, um, but it is a very flexible, it's a very flexible system. And so what else you can do with digital PCR is actually look at copy number analysis or copy number assays. Um, and so, for example, with an EGFR um, project that we have ongoing, we've, had, we've been able to identify three different cell lines where we have very numbers of, of EGFR. And it's, this is a you know a very useful tool for us prior to um, applying them for fish standards because if you can define what's going on at the genetic level using non-fish methods, it gives you great confidence that when you're setting things up with with fish that you're what you're seeing is exactly what you're you should be seeing. And this is a this is sort of a small list of where we've focused on initially for for our fish slide and the different uh, translocations and, and one, one deletion of P10. Uh, obviously, the, one of the most interesting is the EML4 ALK translocation that we have and also you know, the corresponding mutation, the, the ROS1 translocation. What we've done is the mutations that are typically found in, in solids tumors, we've made them as uh, FFP reference slides and the ones that are found as liquid, we've put them as interface spreads or on request we can make uh, metaphase spreads of those as well. 
and we've, we've, we started to, to test a number of different probes from different manufacturers and this is it's, it's, it's highlighted for us and I haven't, I can't, I haven't been able to, to, to show all the data um, but it's highlighted to us that, that using different probes you certainly need to use different methods and different uh, protocols because if you have one standard protocol and you use say a probe from Empire Genomics, a probe from Cytosel, a probe from Abbott, a probe from Createch, the, the signal, the performance of those probes will vary greatly. You can, we found that you can optimize every single probe, but technically you have to, op, you have to, you have to optimize your, your assay to make sure those probes are working. And so if you can get to, if you have reference slides and you can optimize your, your uh, technique with, with reference slides, you then, then will give you great confidence that you can then apply those probes to uh, to your clinical samples and then you've, you rather than uh, spending you know spending all, you know waste almost wasting your your uh, precious patient material on setting up assays and testing assays you can do a lot of that that pre that um, sort of the, uh, research and development work using reference slides it's especially important that I should add it's especially point important when you you're working with with mutations that are so rare that you may only see you know a handful of positive results each year um, and these are these are some other other slides where other slides from our so we've got the ML ENL and the runx x one here you you're looking at we've put we've got slightly better images on our website if you want to look but here you're looking at and, and my laser pointer is actually bigger than the cell um, so here's the the fusion. Here's the fusion. So this is the break apart. So that's a normal, and then you've got the break apart of ML and ENL in the, the red and the green, and the, it's the opposite for the Runx X1, Runx XT1 uh, dual fusion, where you're looking at uh, a, uh, a green and a, a red would be normal, and then when they come together, you've got the fusion. So how so how we're looking at um, or how we you know we, we would suggest that you can use reference slides is Certainly, at the stage of, of evaluating probes, or even if you're looking at switching between suppliers, do you have reference material to then? You know, does my probe work? Um, with this slide, yes, it does. Okay, we'll bring in another probe, and then we can test it again. And I think, and this is this is um, possibly will be become much more important is the daily process monitoring to so ensure that your your probe is what is working on the day of the test. And make sure that what you're seeing is not background or non-specific staining. Um, and I was talking to a, a number of pathologists last week, and they were they were saying that with with the with the EML fallout testing, because they don't see positive samples that often, they ne they always worry that uh, the probe may have gone off. And so, without having a positive, without actually having a positive slide to run each time you run the test, you don't necessarily know if the the probe is always is, is working. Then moving on, um, and this is more for you know this is more um, speculative at this point into the intensity intensity score reference standards. So where we're looking at uh, we're looking at uh, generating low expressor mut mutants, medium expressor mutants, and, and high expressors. So then we can we can generate intensity scores of, of say zero to, to three. We've had uh, We've had uh, some success, so we've got a. We now have an email for out IHC slide uh, that shows what we would class somewhere between medium high to high expressor using the the, the antibody from Fantana. What this has done, uh, certainly internally here, is is opened a, a bit of a can of worms because we're now we're using this as a, a baseline to then generate additional uh, additional cell lines. All have different uh, gene expressions because it's so because the out testing is so for IHC is so is so new. It's difficult to know how what a, what a say a, uh, a strong expressor is versus the medium. And is it if you use one antibody is one antibody that is a say comes one antibody is, comes out as a low expressor could actually then be seen as a high using a different antibody. And so, at this point, by having the reference standard, we can start to answer that question, and it will really help moving forward. And I think, so what what we plan to do is is get these get reference slides, look at look to identify low, medium, and high, 
and then we can start doing antibody comparisons. What I would say is um, definitely an opportunity for for you guys who are running this test or running you know, maybe not the out test, but if you're running other IHC, is if there if there are no guidelines right now, you can start to if you start to use reference slides at this point, you can then start to gather information about the test that you're running. So, for example, if you, I mean, this is a you know completely theoretical example, but if we stay with the ALK story, if say with the ALK expression, maybe ALK expression where you, if you've got a one plus score with ALK, you respond really well to chrysostomy. If you then have an ALK expression at you know a three plus, the response maybe is is, is poorer. So you don't respond you don't respond as well, and maybe you know you don't respond at all. And so, if by knowing that you've got a one plus and a three plus at this point, when it comes to then evaluating or analysing the treatment or success of treatment, you can then apply it back to the, the test. And unless you've got a reference standard at this point and a reference side at this point in your test, you won't have any way of benchmarking really what you've seen. And so, although uh, although it's not essential for say the ALK to have reference slides, and now by having a reference slide you'll be able to retrospectively then use the data from uh, post-treatment to, to work out you know, the, the success of it and maybe then uh, help to personalize the, the treatment moving forward. And so this, I've summarized in a similar way to the fish of how, we, you, know, how you could use uh, reference slides, so very much for antibody evaluation, you know, who do you get your antibody from, which clone do you choose, which ones work using your standard protocol and also for the, the the daily process monitoring, so ensure that the, the tissue is being processed correctly, ensure the tumor samples being treated, you know, treated as delicately as possible, and that you're able to um, perform antigen retrieval for good staining. Now, with at Horizon Diagnostics, we've worked very closely with uh, you know a lot of a lot of the proficiency scheme organisers, both in in Europe and, and the US. We're continuing to, continuing to do that, and we are looking to, to really push uh, the standardization of FISH and IHC through these proficiency schemes. We're also working at the, the lab level as well as the, the cancer center level and talking to uh, the likes of the FDA and also the EM, EMEA to really try and standardize all of these, all of these diagnostic tests. At, at the end of the day, for us, and this is a slide we, we sometimes put at the start, but I often put it at the end. For us, what we, I mean, every, every person in our company has in some way been, been touched by cancer, unfortunately, whether it's a colleague or a friend or a family member. And, a, and what we want to do as, as a team is, is ensure that anyone that is being tested in the future, if they do get, if they are, do have cancer, if they are being tested in the future, is to ensure that the molecular diagnostic test they're having or the IHC test or the FISH test they have is as accurate as it can be and no mistakes are made because you require an accurate test to then get an accurate treatment, especially as, as personalized medicine uh, becomes more and more personalized. And so that's, I mean, that's, and as you get, as you get better testing and better treatment, you will eventually get better patient outcomes. So I'd like to thank you very much for your time and, and listening to my talk.